right. Good afternoon, everybody, and good morning if you're uh, somewhere else around the world or on the West Coast. Uh, thanks for joining our weekly Thursday webinars. I'm pretty excited this week. We're going to be going over uh, common errors in fiberglass repair. And I'm joined with uh, Jeff Rice, who's the Technical Vice President of Gujan Brothers, uh, as well as Richard Downs Honey, who is the President of the Landing School up in Maine. Um, so these guys are some co composite experts. Uh, they're going to go over some do's and don'ts here, and I think it's going to be uh, pretty beneficial. Uh, as always, I'm going to go through a few uh, few other slides for us here. Oh, there we go. Uh, we're continuing to work from home. Uh, Maryland just allowed boating for our office, so people down there are going to be able to start getting on the water. Uh, we're continually working really hard to develop as many resources as we can to help the industry. Um, so if you have any tech questions, membership questions, uh, or the education department, you can let us know. Um, these are weekly. We are continuing to do these. We don't plan on stopping anytime soon. Uh, our members are really enjoying it and those who are members. So uh, if you're interested in membership, just let us know. Uh, there's some great benefits there, but these are free to anybody. Feel free to share them once on YouTube or whatever you'd like to do. Uh, CEUs, if you're attending and want to get your continuing education unit, uh, we have the same process as we had last week where you will receive an automated email from GoToWebinar with a link to uh, apply for those CEUs. If you have any questions with that, you can email education at abycinc.org. And any questions you have during the presentation, uh, we're gonna do it the same way. At the end, uh, I'll be reading the questions off to our presenters. So type them in the, the uh, question box and we will get to them. Uh, our online resources, as always, we have our uh, standard online certification. Uh, we have our great textbook that, uh, thanks again to A Media for putting that together. Uh, digital version, if you know any schools who can use some help right now or are looking for resources, uh, let us know. You can go to teachboats.org, uh, and we do have a weekly newsletter we're sending out to all those people, too, that, to keep them in the loop. So feel free to share that information uh, with anybody you like. Uh, our certifications, if you'd like to challenge our exams, we do have an online proctor service still. Uh, it's a great way to do it. Take it from the comfort of your home, in your sweatpants, whatever you're wearing these days. Uh, and our online learning system. We did not launch any new sales this week because we are actually really excited to migrate over to our new learning management system. Uh, it's going to be more user-friendly. Uh, so you may see some hiccups as you go through if you're taking any of our online courses uh, over the next couple weeks, but I promise you in the end, it, it's all worth it because the new system's gonna be really robust and great. Uh, we do have our interactive classes and we're gonna have a scheduled out for most of the rest of the year, hopefully in the next couple weeks uh, to include corrosion uh, and some of our other certification classes, just trying to build out what the best time for them are. It's always gonna be this similar format, three days a week from 3 p.m. to 4.30. Uh, it's live, it's interactive, you can ask questions, as well as our instructors are available in between via email, whatever you need. These are the two we currently have scheduled. Uh, there is openings in them, so feel free to register if you like, and any questions, uh, feel free to let me know. And lastly, our next week's presentation is gonna be on marine insurance basics. So getting back to the basics of 101 of marine insurance, you know, whether you're a technician, a business owner, just what you need, what you have, what to look for, how it applies, and uh, all that good stuff. So we're really excited to have Jay Forget from uh, Starkweather and Shepley uh, present on that. And I believe he might have another person from his company joining him, uh, a little more ocean information on that too. So once again, there'll be something for everybody uh, as we continue to go roll with these uh, webinars. Uh, so with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff and we'll be able to get things going here. Okay. All right, and I'm gonna yeah. drop my camera. Okay, and let me, okay, so do we look good, David? Yeah, we're good, Richard, you can, uh, you know, unless you want to keep yourself up, it's up to you, but you can drop off the camera if you like. I'll disappear. Okay. Okay. All right, well, I'll start. Hi, I'm, I'm Jeff Wright. Uh, Vice President of uh, Technical Services at Gujan Brothers. We manufacture West System and ProSet Epoxy. And uh, my background is I have a mechanical engineering degree. I've uh, in school worked in many boat yards, uh, worked at Tierriot for about seven years doing the engineering work on composites and have been with Gujan Brothers uh, pushing into my 19th year. I'll let uh, in Richard uh, introduce himself. Yeah, you might have trouble understanding me, unless I speak slowly, because I'm from New Zealand originally. I'm now the president at the landing school in Maine, boat building and yacht design school. Uh, I have a background in composites. I uh, had a business in New Zealand, uh, had some activity over here called High Modulus, 
selling uh, resins and fiberglass and doing engineering. Like Jeff, I'm an engineer. So we've been involved in designing and engineering boats that should stay together. So um, we, no, we don't do repairs because our boats don't fall apart unless they hit something. Um, I've been involved in a few repairs over the years. Um, occasionally I've been called in to uh, be an expert witness in a court case. Um, and I've learned that being an expert witness in a court case doesn't mean you know stuff. Uh, I think I'm not batting particularly well. The last three that I can think of I lost. So if you want some advice on repairs, by all means, give me a call. If you want me to appear in court, go talk to someone else. Okay. All right. So, and, and the Kiwis are fabulous boat builders, so the accent gives us good credibility, Richard. Um, a quick uh, session overview. What, what we're going to do is uh, we're taking an approach of, um, instead of going through the re a repair process step by step, we're going to just sit, hit some high points, what both of us have experienced in our careers, of uh, just that common mistake. Uh, so we'll define a, a, a basic repair so we're all on the same page and understanding what we're trying to achieve, and then you can see the topics listed. Uh, we're going to touch on common mistakes of each one of those. Uh, summer at the end, that's more for those that uh, may be looking at this after. You can pull that up and see, and then, of course, we will have uh, time for questions at the end. And so I'm going to hit it off. Just, there's just so much to cover in this in this topic. You know, we Jeff and I have both done fairly long sessions at IBEX on just elements of this. Um, and and please, uh, within the half hour, we're just gonna if, if afterwards you've got questions, your front page has got our emails and phone numbers. Happy to come back to us and we'll fill in the details. Uh, or you can come to the landing school for a year. Jeff. Exactly. So uh, just for nomenclature, uh, and just so you're aware of those that are, are relatively new to fiberglass construction, there's two basic types out there. I'm just gonna touch on what's called, uh, when you hear somebody say it's a solid laminate, well, all boats are solid to some extent, but what we're referring to is the laminate of the boat is simply reinforcing fabric and resin. Uh, usually, obviously, fiberglass, uh, it's, the, it's easy to build, it's easier to repair, it's still used commonly today. Generally, any boat prior to maybe 1980 in the production world is gonna be solid. Uh, frankly, it's only disadvantage is weight uh, and possibly some cost, but um, Rich is gonna discuss what's called a cord laminate, which is uh, very common today uh, and it massively reduces weight. Uh, sandwich construction or cord laminate has something like a foam or a balsa core in the middle of two much thinner fiberglass skins. Um, we used to advertise, and I've seen a dozen other people advertise, lighter, stronger, and faster. Um, and, and yes, you do reduce weight, but it's not necessarily stronger. We can argue about that when you come to hit things. Um, and faster, not necessarily faster to repair, because if you've got two skins and a core, as you'll see, uh, the approach and the process of finding where the damage is and, and eliminating and replacing it can be quite complex. You really want to know whether underneath the gel coat is a solid or single skin laminate or a sandwich one before you start attacking it with your grinder because there are different approaches to be used. And unfortunately, you can't tell from the outside. So this diagram here is how a, a, a fiberglass laminate is repaired, a cross-section. And you'll see this applies to both cord and solid laminates. And the key takeaways are uh, that scarf, what we call 12 to 1 ratio. And that, that's a minimum. You can have a longer scarf ratio. In fact, on very high performance uh, boats and aircraft, things like that, they do expect a, a, a longer scarf ratio. But the purpose of that is to do a couple of things. One, you can see it gives a lot of binding area for that, that patch area, which is on the right, where your new laminate is coming in. So it gives you more surface area, which reduces the load per square inch. And it also gives a nice transition for the load, when the load is applied to the repaired area, to transfer that into the original area. So just similar to you would not butt joint pieces of plywood together, expect them to be very strong uh, when doing repair you, you, you want to taper it, get a good scarf ratio, increase surface area, and, uh, and reduce stress concentration. And we, we always suggest uh, matching the thickness of the original laminate, assuming the repair you're making is based on damage, uh, that the boat struck something and you're, you're putting it back to original. 
uh, there's no there's no need to go thicker or thinner. Uh, we think you get best performance matching the original, assuming you're not repairing a design or construction defect. Would you um, like that? Yeah, on the uh, the thickness, there's a lovely little diagram here showing three plies lapping up with a dotted line saying that you've got to sand the excess away. Um, and just as a practical thing, you want to match the thickness. The thickness in the production boat environment was created by as thick plies or as few heavyweight plies as possible to reduce the labor. You might not want to do that in the repair. You might want to use more thinner plies to get the same total thickness because the amount that will stick out above the blue line and need to be sanded off will be less. So whereas we say you need to match what was there, you will find as we talk about the, the materials that, that you can match the performance without necessarily matching the exact materials and make it easier for you when you come to sanding, which you will come to do. So in assessing, now that uh, we know how to do the repair, assessing the damage, uh, before you go too far, always inspect the gel coat. Uh, it's, it can tell you a story in many cases. And so if you see the two on the left, um, blunt tr force trauma on the outside is it just simply it, it hit a rock and you have a crack but you can have things come from the inside i, I remember once when an anchor road locker came loose in a bow and fell onto the inside of the hull and so the cracking pattern is very different so if if you just see cracks uh they can can tell a story and i'll let richard talk about the picture on the right a little more the one on the right, the cracks are running along or parallel to the, the bulkhead that's hidden on inside. Uh, and, and the cracks are tension cracks in the gel coat. So the, the laminate is flexing around that bulkhead, bending. Uh, and if it's been designed properly and been used properly and hasn't hit anything, those cracks shouldn't appear. It indicates that in normal everyday use, it's been overloaded or strained to the point where the gel coat's cracking. And if you just repair the gel coat in that situation, um, it'll happen again. So sometimes you need to look at whether the damage has occurred by an unusual, unexpected incident, like an anchor road coming loose, or whether there is something uh, more fundamental that needs to be repaired or made better than it was. And that may be a situation where an engineer gets involved to not only replace the damaged material, but reinforce it so it doesn't happen again. And one more thing I'd just like to add, if you look at those diagrams very closely, our artist uh, drew them very accurately to show that some gel coat cracks don't go into the laminate, but some do. And the only way you can discover those is by uh, removing the gel coat. Uh, I'll touch on this slide. This was a test we did at Gujan, and although these are uh, uh, lo low density wood panels, uh, they're just pine, you know, basically, uh, I can't remember the exact wood, but just pine, let's say that has laminated on both sides. Uh, they, you see on the top picture where you see the masking tape, a weight was dropped onto that as an impact. But the bottom picture with the red X is actually the back side away. So that'd be the inside of the boat, let's say. And you can see the damage is radically different on the inside than the outside. So on a cord laminate, you do need to see both sides of what's going on. And furthermore, uh, most production power boats have a thicker skin on the outside than the inside for various production reasons for cosmetics. So do, do not make too much conclusion just looking at the outside of the skin. Um, and there's even, Richard, do you have some comments? Yeah, look, um, I've seen situations with relatively robust, thick outside skins um, where, you know, you've bumped into a wharf or bumped into a rock and you go, wow, isn't that strong? There's hardly a scratch on the surface. I can buff that out. And the laminate's not even broken. And you may not even see anything on the inside, particularly if it's been flow coated and painted. Um, but it is possible that between those two skins, the core element has been damaged. It might've been crushed. More likely it's failed in what's called shear, which people often refer to as delamination. Uh, so if you have a sandwich laminate, be wary that you don't just fix what you can see. Look for either damage on the inside or potentially by ultrasound and other methods, damage that's hidden in the core. And the example of C, it looks like a simple dent, but boy, the inside shows a lot more. 
So, so now that we, those are some tips in assessing the damage, uh, we have to remove the damage uh, before we, we can fix it. So th this can be a big job. And it, it may not be obvious when all the damage is removed. Uh, certainly cra big cracks and things are always visible. But uh, one tip we like, I like to suggest is as when you get the visible damage removed, get water or even better yet, uh, Dykem Blue in a, a fast evaporating solvent like Machinist Fuse. And that can be used to identify cracks that are not visible to the eye. Because once you start, the gel coat's gone away, you'll have kind of a brown laminate and cracks will not easily be visible. So uh, it, it, it takes a, a bit of an eye and a little special technique to identify all the cracks. I, I was helping on a patrol boat, a 15 meter, 55 foot high speed uh, patrol boat in the Middle East. It had a, uh, unexpected damage. It, it came out of the water and landed right on a mooring buoy, right on the knuckle on the, on the bow of the boat on the center line, which was solid laminate. Um, and they cut away a hole that was, you know, couple of inches either side of the center line and, and maybe two feet long and put a lovely taper on it and came back the next day uh, ready to start applying laminate uh, to repair it. And, and they saw this very fine line of something weeping out from between the plies. Um, and uh, it sniffed it and it was fuel. And they ground the hole a wee bit bigger and wiped it and it wept out again. And there was a crack in the laminate from the impact at the bow that extended all the way back to the integral fuel tanks, which were a long way back. So that little two foot hole uh, was ground out to be about uh, 30 feet long until they got back to the point where there were no cracks in the laminate and they got past them. In that case, they had the telltale fuel weeping out from between the plies through the crack. But uh, Jeff's idea of um, wiping it with a, with a dye to see those cracks that you otherwise wouldn't be able to pick up with it, the naked eye is most important. So speaking of removing damage and repairs getting larger, uh, stress loves corners. Stress loves sharp edges. So uh, if you look at the diagram, I show let's just some, some imaginary damage had an odd shape. So it's not a simple uh, circle. The picture on top, that would be the easiest one to cut out with the saw, but what you want is the shape down below. Even though it's potentially larger area, uh, removing those sharp edges removes, removes those stress concentrations um, that, that will make the repair hold up better and reduce the chance of it wanting to peel off uh, around the perimeter. And in, in regards to grinding, this is a, another picture of that bevel, but what I wanna emphasize here is you see that little triangle with the one to 12 ratio. If we notice, it is a triangle. It's not, it's not half of a uh, half pipe for snowboarders or skateboards. In other words, everything is straight. That's not easy to do, especially when you're using a rotary tool to grind. You tend to have the, uh, you're, you'll tend to make a dish. And so, that one to 12 ratio may end up that you're standing three inches back, but you have to uh, get that very flat taper. And a trick to do, uh, a very obvious way to see it is uh, if you do it on plywood as practice, because you'll see the glue lines and it's really interesting how they will all e be evenly spaced. So consider, you know, getting a straight edge, even a little bit of modeling clay as you're doing it and uh, put that down. It, even though it's one of the dirtier jobs, it's, it's a job that does require a lot of attention to detail. And uh, this, this basically touches on the same thing, showing how to uh, tackle a, uh, a cord repair. Uh, but note with those thin skins, those bevels don't become very long. Uh, there's no harm in making those greater. You can go 20 to one, 24 to one, and on thin skins, uh, when the skin may only be a sixteenth of an inch, it's not. It's uh, there's no harm in doing that. It, it merely strengthens the repair. You'll note here that you don't need to put that bevel on the core. When the core was put in the in the boat, it possibly was contoured or or cut into squares, and and even adjacent sheets were butt joined together. So a butt joining core, properly filled with adhesive. Is plenty strong enough. You don't need the the taper and to and to have a taper on the foam or the balsa core. Jeff was talking about um, the preparation and 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 how you know with a disc grinder or, or, or a sanding tool, 
it's quick and and but may not be as uh, flat as possible you use that to shape the repair you finish sanding by hand uh, to get it you know, to the nth degree without suddenly gouging the laminate but the other thing to remember is you're working with the material most production boat building rim systems um, somewhere between 200 and 250 degrees f they're going to start to soften when they soften you know, you'll be moving resin, gooey resin or half gooey resin around the surface. Um, it, it's not the surface isn't what you want. You want that clean, hard fiberglass surface. But if you happen to heat them to 350F or thereabouts, um, the resin's actually going to start to break down. And that will, the resin will burn or degrade before you see flames. It's not going to catch fire. You can do damage to the resin at that interface by getting it too hot with your tool. Then when you bond to it with your repair, you are bonding to resin, which is not good. So um, you, know, you may want to get it done in a hurry and you may want to put the effort into it, but watch that heat build up, particularly if you've got a sandwich laminate and it's, it's got a core behind it, which insulates it. When you sand, you create dust. Dust is not as bad as you might think. Dust is not much different than the stuff we put in resins to fill it. Okay, it's not hollow, but it's small particles. If you get dust on the surface and you're trying to paint it, it's a no-no. Thin coat of paint, little bits of dust ain't going to look good. Put a little bit of dust in the surface, you know, wipe it clean, dry, wipe it off, dry it off. But if it was a wee bit of freshly sanded dust and it got wet by the resin, it's not the end of the world. The process of using solvents can help clean it but can also cause problems you can contaminate the surface by using a dirty rag or a rag that's been used to clean something else or even if you do have a contaminant somewhere on the surface let's say it's a hot day and you've been sweating and you've dropped sweat on one part or, or somebody's come along and, and and if there is any contaminant there putting it in the rag in the solvent and spreading it over the whole surface is probably best uh, worse than leaving a little drop of contamination. So there are situations where solvent washing is a good thing to do, but for most situations, a clean wipe with a dry cloth and ignore the sand, the, the sanding dust. It's not that end of the world. And the reason we're <laughs> emphasizing that is uh, at Gujan Brothers, especially with our West System line, we we find people have most of if they have a failure is generally due to adhesion. Uh, if we think of a fiberglass boat, we have all these long fibers in the glass uh, running through the length of it. That's what's distributing the load. But the repair is completely dependent on the adhesion. The fibers, the old fibers, don't run into the new fibers. That's so adhesion is very important. And contamination, uh, Richard mentioned a great one coming from hands and sweat. Uh, but in northern climates, we find furnaces that aren't running well. Uh, do that. If it's a small shop and there's lots of mechanical work going on and a two-stroke outboard is putting out a lot of smoke, that can be a source of contamination. Uh, so what we always recommend is uh, do your final sanding, your final preparation shortly before you're going to laminate. Uh, we don't suggest doing all that work and then putting it over in the corner because a lot of things uh, could happen between that time and when you go to laminate. So uh, we talked earlier about the material being you know, the same thickness as what you started with. And there's often an argument that says, if you're going to put it back to how it was, you should use exactly the materials that were used by the original boat builder. Um, this is one situation where having better materials is better. If you're a production boat builder, having a better resin and a better fiberglass and a better core material adds cost. And, and over the um, whole boat, that can be significant. But if you're doing a repair, anyone that's done the maths on it will realize that you know, the difference between paying $3 a pound and $6 a pound for your resin is nothing compared to the labor that's going into that cost, into that repair. The costing of labor and other things are far more uh, significant. And there are a number of reasons why you would look to using a better resin system than was originally specified. For starters, it may be that the environment that you're working in just doesn't um, suit the system that the original builder used. He may have had a controlled environment. It may have been air conditioned. Um, 
he may have been using a process such as infusion that requires a very low viscosity resin and you're doing a hand laminating repair. So it doesn't necessarily follow that because it was built with XYZ resin, you have to use XYZ resin. Um, this following table here gives you a bit of a guide as to uh, what sort of resins you should be using for what sort of base laminate. If, if the thing was built out of epoxy, either a prepreg or infused or wet bag, you are probably better to use an epoxy than a polyester or a vinyl ester to fix it. Epoxies, you know, sit at the top of the tree, um, and and a good epoxy is is a good bet. In fact, there's no such thing as a bad epoxy. Jeff might disagree because he sells epoxy, but there's <laughs> good epoxies and very good epoxies. At least when you compare them with bad polyesters. So, uh, in terms of the attributes that we're looking for in a repair, which, as Jeff has pointed out, is adhesion you can't go wrong uh, with an epoxy. Now, you may have some other issues in terms of workability and, 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 and viscosity, depending on your temperature. Curing time can be an issue, having, having to get you know, the working time being too long. So there are applications where a vinyl ester can be used. Using a polyester um, to repair you know, can work, um, but you kind of ask yourself, why would I bother when I could get a better resin and, and avoid Bear in mind that when you do the repair, by the nature of the, even with the 12 to 1 and, and with the staggers and fabrics, there's going to be a stress concentration there. So having something that's going to carry the load a wee bit better is always a good idea. This picture here, I uh, just want to represent two dramatically different repairs, a simple hole and a hole side destroyed. Uh, the one on the left, the back is quite simple because uh, you have to have something to laminate again. So you can see we suggest it's a little disc with a couple screws to pull through and hold in place uh, with a little glue on the back side. The boat on the right requires a lot more carpent uh, uh, boat building carpentry skills. But what I want to emphasize uh, is that if that's not done well, if the backer is not in the right, does not have the right shape, it will just get more difficult. Uh, people who have a uh, boat building experience from the landing school know that the frames need to be fair before you plank the boat. If you plank unfair frames, it just becomes much harder. So the, we strongly suggest, you know, spend as much time as you can to get the backer as close to the shape that you need and not count on fairing to uh, get you there. Um, this is where the 90-90 rule applies. The first 90% of the job which is fixing the hole, takes 90% of the time. The other 10% of the job, which is making it look really nice, takes the other 90% of the time. And it can be a lot more than that. Um, you'd be surprised until you've done it, how much time and effort goes into filling, fairing, and making it look good. The repair has to be structurally sound, but it also has to be cosmetically acceptable. And the time spent to create the right backer with the right shape will save you time further down the track. So this uh, this was an entire uh, seminar at IBEX of when you need to vacuum bag your repairs and when you don't. Vacuum bags are, is a great processing technique and uh, it's all over the internet to learn how to do it and so forth. But uh, we always, I have probably talked to more people out of vacuum bagging their repairs than I have encouraged them to do so. It's like any other process that things can go wrong. Um, it can also make your laminate too thin by compacting it. So there are places for it, but most production boats do not use vacuum bag technology. And even ones that do, depending on where you're repairing it, hand layup might be okay. So just, uh, it, is, it is a great technology, but um, really analyze, put a lot of thought into whether you need it. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw one out there that the engineers will go, what do you mean? And then people have to come to me later. but. A lot of people say vacuum bagging makes the laminate stronger. It makes the laminate stronger per cross-sectional area, per square inch, because it pulls resin out of it and makes it thinner. But the strength is in the fiberglass. It's fiber reinforced plastics. And if you've got three layers of woven roving or fiberglass cloth, they're going to carry the same amount of load whether you vacuum bag them or not. Uh, and what you're trying to do here is make the boat carry load which is not per cross-sectional area it's per load so the same number of plies vacuum bag hasn't made the boat stronger if anything as jeff says it may have made it weaker if it made it thinner um this one here uh, sorry the next one is peel ply isn't it 
keep up with the slides. Yeah. And, and neither one of us sell it, but we're going to tell you how good it is. Once you've used it, you'll never go back. When you're buying the stuff at West Marine or when you're at your local you know, Chandler or Composites One or whoever's selling you the stuff and you're looking at this and you got your resin and you got your tools and you got your buckets and you got your cleaners and you got and somebody goes, you want some of this stuff? And you go, what is it? It's stuff you throw away when you finish with it. And you go, really? You know? Peel ply is the last layer on called release fabric here. It, it's just, you never go back. It smooths things out. It makes the uh, preparation before you put your fairing compound on easier. It prevents runs from going down the site. It's like, I urge you, you know, two, three, four dollars a yard. Get some peel ply and use it. Um, you'll never go back. It's just, it's a false economy to think, oh, we'll just sand that surface. Just rip the peel ply off and get on with it. Um. Back to the details and fabric, uh, cutting, patterning in the pieces is uh, also very important, just like getting your back or in the right place. If you don't pattern the pieces correctly and they end up being too big, you end up having a whole lot of grinding of fiberglass. And if you pattern them poorly, maybe it'll take unnecessary amount of favoring. And it's a lot nicer to be at a workbench with dry hands and dry fiberglass cutting at the shape than uh, sanding fair sanding, fairing compound, or glass. So we re recommend doing that. And just uh, the large patch versus small patch. My experience is in generally in industry, the large patch first is considered a marine repair. It, it has some advantages in that you get good contact with adhesion because you have that one first layer has intimate contact all the way through the repair area, all the way up your scarf. We also believe that having all of the ends come up like they did in the first pair, uh, first slide, show that they're easier to sand off. Small patch is uh, very is, is required in aerospace and aviation repairs. It's an excellent way to go too. But at Gujan, we recommend the large patch because we believe the background between the small patch is assuming that you're using thin plies of pre-preg material. You may have even done a step scarf instead of a tapered scarf. And you also will have the ability to put one piece over the entire repair to have continuous fiber on the outside which is not acceptable on the side of a yacht. But next time you get on an airplane, look at the side. Uh, doublers or patches over are very acceptable in commercial aviation. Anything you'd like to add, uh, Richard? Yeah, um, you can imagine if the last ply was then part of the fairing process, you'd put the last large ply all the way out to the edge, but in fairing, you sanded it off. So it wasn't even bonded to the outside, you'd broken that. You can do it both ways. One thing I was gonna note is, you know, you can cut out nice little rectangles or sometimes your repair is not that shape and you've got to cut out some odd shape and then you pick your material up and it changes shape and you go why did i bother if you've got a material that doesn't have a mat backing or is unstable when cut uh, it may be worth putting those pieces of material on a plastic backing piece of uh, um, you know, simple polyethylene or, or vacuum bag material wetting them out on that and then picking them up and applying them to the job been peeling off the plastic before the next layer goes on. That's one way of keeping odd shapes stable. Yeah, that's a great tip. So uh, back to uh, back to corners, a uh, very common topic because it's a problem. Uh, if you're gluing in any components, uh, we uh, we recommend using a filleting or an adhesive to uh, do a fillet or, or round all the corners. Um, Machinists have known about corners for years. A good machinist when making underwater gear or, or prop shafts will always uh, rate, you know, machine a, a radius into all the corners because they know that that's where the metal will crack. Uh, composites, it's the same philosophy. So always rounding corners. And uh, if you do, in the case of tabbing, uh, what we call ply drops, staggering them back so you get a gradual thickness change. Uh, stress loves corners and uh, dramatic changes in geometry. So anything you can do to avoid that is, uh, is better. So on the string on the right, I would argue that that's actually stronger than if all three plies went out to the edge. So in that case, we actually applied less fabric, but by having that gentle transition, that tabbing is much less likely to peel off of the bottom when it deflects. Fearing. Okay, so you've put the fiberglass on, it's all stuck, it's been, you know, you've, you're finished, apart from the fact you've got to make it look good. 
And if you haven't done this, I got to tell you, it's no fun. Uh, and there's a skill involved. You know, finding the high and low spots, putting on material at the right process. I mean, um, you get to do a lot of this when you come to the landing school, which is often referred to as the sanding school, because you know we get the composite guys to sand and fill and fair and, and prepare a plug to make a boat mold off. And the wooden boat guys are, are doing the same at the other end of the shop. Um, it, it is a skill and a process. And uh, if you do your planning, you map out the area, you take it in steps, you will get there. You may feel that you're taking too many steps and, and it's taking too long and you want to rush ahead and put a big wad of uh, filler on and then get into it with the sander. You're better off to put uh, fewer uh, applications in the areas that need it and work your way through them. This this will kill your hours if you if you don't take a measured approach to the fairing process. The materials that you use, um, you've gone to the trouble of getting a better resin system than the boat was built out of. You've gone to the trouble of you know putting more lighter plies on to make your sanding and 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 scarf taper uh, gentler. You know this is not the time to pick up what I call car bog, lovely quick curing red putty and smear it all over your boat. That stuff was not designed to go in the water on boats. You're better to use either a pre-mixed fairing compound uh, or use the resin system you've got and add fillers to it and, and get the right consistency. Um, it, it's, it may seem nice and easy to sand some of those uh, pre-mixed car fillers, but they're designed for filling small bumps on metal cars. They're not designed for, for fairing boats, I'm sorry. And more is not better. Um, if you put it on in a big thick wad, uh, you can have all sorts of problems. It can look good, you can turn your back and then it can sag. Um, its cure rate will be different in the thicker parts than the thin parts. And as it cures, particularly if using a violet or even a polyester, it will shrink more and you can get little cracks appearing in it or it can heat up um, or you know you can trap solvents again with polyesters and vinyl esters within thick applications and it doesn't cure properly it may seem as if it's taking you longer to put down two or three thin applications and sand between them but it's one of the biggest traps is just to get a thicker wad of putty and smear it over and hope that you get it fair and you'll be swearing and cursing three or four applications down when you still can't get rid of the high spots. Uh, as uh, we often say, the owner of the boat generally judges the entire repair by the top one thousandth of an inch, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so yeah, environmental conditions, uh, you know, we're in Michigan and obviously a lot of repair happens there. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, you can only wear, you have a limit to how cold you can go. Uh, resin, they are a chemical reaction, and chemical reactions uh, generally uh, perform better when they're warm. So be, be very careful when it gets, gets too cold. The resin, even if it gels up, it may not fully cure at those temperatures. So look at the tech data sheet of the resin you're using, no matter what chemistry, epoxy, or polyester it is. Um, I can speak as a resin supplier. Those are not arbitrary values, and we want our customers to be successful while we provide them. So call, you know, call them, and there may be other solutions, um, uh, different hardeners you want to use uh, in the case of epoxy uh, or catalyst level for a polyester. So cool temperatures will slow, and you'll also notice the viscosity or thickness will increase, which can make them very hard to wet out fabrics uh, compared to what you may be used to. And then uh, the opposite is uh, true when it comes in heat. Uh, they can cure much, much faster. So a slower hardener in the case of epoxy, potentially lower catalyst level in a polyester or formulation would be important. And uh, for very thick repairs, you have to watch out for what's called resin exotherm. Uh, the reactions generate a heat when they cure. If it's warm out, they can't dissipate their heat. And basically, a chain reaction happens where the heat just becomes ex very excessive. So there's a guide uh, to what temperatures the resins are suited, uh, and stronger you can have problems if you get outside of that. And finally, one other environmental condition um, is uh, uh, condensation. So moisture 
does not generally affect the curing of a resin. In the case of epoxy, you might get a blush on the surface, but uh, it's a two it's a it's two components come to react. It's not like a paint, particularly polyurethane paint, that is reacting with moisture in the air or evaporating. But where we have seen moisture, the problem is if you're working on a large lead keel, let's say, and it's under the boat and it was 50 degrees during the evening. Well, at eight o'clock in the morning, it's not. It's going to take a long time for that keel to come up to temperature. Uh, that can cause curing issues because that is such a heat sink. But in the case of in the U.S. Navy, for example, they always recommend that the surfaces have to be five degrees above the dew point uh, or anticipated dew point. And that's easy to get nowadays with all our weather apps. So keep that in mind, too. If the if dew starts to form while the resin is curing, that can create create some issues if water condenses on the surface. Yeah, I mean, water is not a very good glue. Uh, if you get water between the laminate you're putting on and, and the substrate underneath, it's not going to carry load. If water carried load, we'd laminate boats out of water, but it don't work. Uh, so keep the water mm -hmm. out and, and wash the dew point. Of course, the dew point comes from you know the weather app and, and the temperature and the conditions at the time. Uh, so don't use the weather app for telling us what the temperature of the components are, as uh, Jeff pointed out. The, the keel or the boat um, you know, may have taken some time to heat up and maybe a lot cooler than the ambient temperature. Equally, um, if the sun is beating down on it and it's a dark color, it could be a lot warmer than the air temperature. These little pistol grip thermometers are very, uh, very economical and easy to get and, and with the accuracy the, that you need uh, and not expensive. Um, and you really need one of those to be sure that you know what the temperature of it things are. When you're working with different um, hardness with epoxies, you'll want to change from a slow to a medium to a fast, depending upon the temperature to get the working time. With the polyester and vinyl esters, you know, you'll want to adjust carefully your catalyst ratio. So knowing what the temperature of the part that, that you'd be working on is, is critical. Knowing what you've done and, and remembering it, is fine if you're going to be the only person that ever needs to know because you've got a great memory and you can probably um, recite everything that we've done now without going on the YouTube and, and looking at it later. But if there's anybody else involved, like um, a, a, an assessor or a surveyor for an insurance company, or like another guy down the track that has to um, repair what you've repaired when it gets dinged up again, or uh, a material supplier that's consulting or advising or, or assisting or an engineer that's overseeing it, you know, they can't rely on what you saw and remembered. It's just not that hard to write stuff down. You know, what it was that you used, not the green drum resin, but the numbers <laughs> and letters that are on it, you know, um, and who did the work and what the weather was like. So if something does go wrong, you can sit there and go, I think I know what happened. Well, I think I know where to look for it because um, you think you've done a perfect job and nothing's ever going to go wrong. But let me tell you, when things go wrong, records are wonderful for sorting out how to fix it again. Um, epoxy reasons, and for that matter, polyester and vinyl reasons, don't work if you don't put the right stuff in the, in the container. It's like making a cake, you know? If it calls for two eggs and a cup of milk and you put in a cup of eggs and two bottles of milk, it's gonna be different. It's not gonna work, you know? So there's ratios, um, they're generally given to you by volume and by weight. You know, if you've got a volume marked container and, and you're careful, you can do that. But I'd grab some digital scales. Um, I've got some here in the kitchen that, that weigh to an accuracy of one gram up to, to five kilos, you know, 10 pounds. It's just cheap little scales my daughter uses for checking how many calories she's eating every day. Um, grab those, just don't return them to the kitchen covered in resin. Uh, they're not expensive. Right. They do, doing the maths with a set of numbers that you can read, as opposed to you know looking on the side of a, a dirty container and trying to figure out how far up the side it's come is, is much easier. I'd, I'd always use weight if I had the option for, for working out my ratios. Remember with epoxies, that putting more hardener in does not make it cure faster. It's not how it works. It can work with polyesters and vinyl esters when you know, the speed of the reaction within a range can be affected by the amount of MEKP or catalyst that goes in. 
Again, there's various tools for, for you know, um, measuring the catalyst accurately, because, you know, if you're putting one or 1 1.2 or 1.4 percent of catalyst into a bucket of resin, that's a very small thing. You, you're not going to weigh that on your bathroom scales. Um, so these dispensers are very useful, graduated to, to measure the catalyst. Uh, and, and be careful about that. The difference between 1.2 and 1.6% catalyst in terms of cure time is, or gel time, working time, is enormous. Also be careful, please, with MEKP. Um, of all the materials that we've gone through, from the fiberglass to the core, to the polyesters and the vinyl esters, and the peel plies and the thinners, and the MEKP is the dangerous one, the most dangerous, the most caustic, the most, don't get it anywhere near your eyes or skin or, other parts of your body that don't want to um, feel the pain, um, be very careful with MEKP. Uh, and that's actually a very good reason uh, for using epoxy because you don't have to store that stuff on your facilities and you don't have to worry about the OSHA and, and all of that. You just need to stick with stuff which is not drinkable but far more benign. <laughs> so this is the list. We're not going to read them to you. Um, because like I say, this will be available later, but these are all the, this is the title of each slide. So these are all the common pitfalls uh, at our first pass. And each one of these would warrant an entire uh, seminar, frankly. Um, and, you know, I'm always happy to review any of those. Uh, you have my contact information. Um, but I think Richard, is there anything you'd like to add before we uh, ask for questions? No, I think we're ready for question and answers. I think Dave takes over now and we come back and they can see it. All right. Yeah, yeah. Thanks again, guys. Uh, just as always, I'm going to throw the quick poll up here uh, for our giveaway with a question out of here. So we're going to launch that. Keep your questions coming in. And uh, after I launch the poll here, we can uh, get going. So the poll should be on your screen now. Close the poll here. It looks like people are paying attention. Uh, you know, the question I asked is what's the most common cause of failure, and 91% uh, got poor adhesion. So uh, people are paying attention out there. All right, so let's start at the top here. Uh, one vessel in a slip next to another. If one catches fire and the heat scorches the other, at what heat level would the RFP be compromised? That's a risen question, and, and while I've come across it in some legal issues, um, uh, in my experience from an engineering point of view, um, if you can see any signs of damage, you know, uh, such as scorching, you're definitely in trouble. But there is a gray area where um, the resin has not burnt, uh, but has been degraded. And I think with um, with DSC and tests, you can ascertain whether or not you, you've gone particularly high, but I'll leave that to Jeff. Well, he's not a chemist, he's an um, engineer like me, but he's closer to it. Well, yeah, I work with chemists. So, um, no, it's a tough question because as Rich, clearly the charred areas are damaged. Um, those have to be replaced. What the, heat, what the heat pattern from there is, uh, if there's no visual clues, it would probably require some testing of uh, coupons to understand um, what the damage is. Unfortunately, in those fire events, it gets into uh, the cure, what's that phrase? The cure can kill the patient in that you end up having to do so many, pull so many coupons from the boat that the repairs just become larger and larger. Uh, so it, it is a problem um, that there is not an easy way to do that, but it can be done, uh, it just, uh, to be absolutely certain would require extensive testing, which means more repair work to the boat. And, and sometimes it's easier just to take the call that says, look, it's obviously burnt here, and it's obviously not burnt way down there. How far can we go before we're happy without having to do all the tests? And, and, and you might extend the repair an extra two or three feet past where there's any obvious damage um, into parts where you go, there's nothing wrong here. And you go, yeah, but it would cost me more to, to figure out where the line is than to just draw a line safe. So that's where the, the repair versus the ascertaining the exact nature of the, the transition line 
can be a um, commercial trade-off. And I'd just like to add one more thing. This is a time where an engineer is very valuable because you may need to just analyze the load on the area. Maybe it's a very low risk area. Um, so haul bottom, absolutely, maybe the testing's needed. But if it's uh, an area that a companion way or something like that, then if it's, you know, that the properties might not be so critical. All right, uh, does the 12 to one ratio change if you use something other than epoxy for repair? Um, I'll jump in. Not necessarily. I uh, I think the loads on the laminate uh, drive going to an increased scarf. Like I say, 12 to 1 is a minimum. Um, and if you read literature for repairing higher performance composites found in uh, aerospace and things, they will generally have larger ratios. So if you're suspect of the adhesion quality of your resin, certainly a larger ratio uh may may go for there i will say this that that our 12 to 1 experience is based on our experience with west systems richard what's you know, i'm sure you have something so, uh, there's probably some fat in the 12 to 1 to allow for the fact that people you know vary a wee bit uh and, and we're not entirely sure of the stress being carried across that joint but if you're trying to transfer load into an existing skin that's very thin on a sandwich laminate and the material that you're, you know, transferring to and, and patching with is carbon fiber. It's carrying a lot more load than if it was chop strand glass. So as you go up, as Jeff mentioned, in, in, in terms of technology or exotic level of uh, strength of the, the skin, a larger surface area is going to be required to carry that load across the joint. Um, and, and equally, if you went down in terms of your adhesive capability and you started trying to, you know, um, affect the bond with a resin system, which is just not a very good glue, um, you probably need more area. 12 to 1 is a, a, a good starting point with epoxies, but if you erred on the larger side, uh, it's, it's better than the lower side. I think if you're looking at wood, you know, uh, for instance, scarfing plywood, you know, the, the bond strength with the epoxy, it's the same epoxy essentially, so it's the same strength. But the wood itself has not got the same strength as glass. So, you know, a half inch of fiberglass is going to be carrying more load than a half inch of wood um, because it's stronger. So that's why you probably need a larger scarf with, with composites than you would with wood. All right. Uh, if the hardener has turned a reddish brown color when you add the epoxy, is that going to uh, off color the outcome of the cure clear? And is it safe to use? That's an epoxy yeah. one, Jeff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, some hardeners, especially ones that are in metal cans, can darken with age. And uh, at least with Goujon products, we know that that does not affect the properties. If, if that's what the question is, it, it, when added with the resin, it will, uh, not, it will reduce the color slightly, but it'll have a tint, but there'll be no effect in properties. If the resin, I, the way I read that, if the resin darkened, if you know um, when it came together, I would be suspect something might be going on. Resins generally maintain very clear, so if a, a resin product is shipped colors on you, I might be suspicious that's contaminated. But hardeners can darken with age, and as long as they've been in a sealed container, that that will not be a problem. But uh, reading between the lines, there's another underlying thing in this question that, that um, you can address uh, from a UV perspective. The obvious thing oh, was if you if you make the resin a bit darker, you know, structurally I'm not that worried, um, but it will affect the clarity of the finished product. And if you wanted clearness in the finished product, it's probably because you want to look at it and you're not going to paint it. And if you're not going to paint it and you want it to be clear so that you can see something through it, it better not be outside without the right sort of overcoating of UV resistant um, uh, polyurethanes or, or other coatings. Um, I've just discovered after doing a test where I fiberglassed with epoxy the roof of my house in New Zealand, um, that after 18 years, the resin does break down in the sun. And my son of 18 years old is now at home trying to repair it. So if you're looking for clarity, make sure that you protect the epoxy because it may look clear the day you produce it, but I think it goes yellow in the sun first, doesn't it, uh, Jeff? Yeah, yeah, and thanks for bringing that up. 
and I'll take it will uh, it will become it will yellow and then become chalky. It is not resistant to UV, but as you said, just a simple polyurethane coating will look great. But I will add one thing: uh, both our company and our all the major epoxy companies out there uh, offer formulations specific for clear applications. So for those that want to do a clear carbon finish, um, then uh, make sure you talk to the the formulator to get the one because uh, there are some formulation techniques. Uh, products. They're, they're formulation specific to maintain clarity even better, and you want to be sure to use those. All right, we got some time for a couple more questions here. Uh, what is the best time to remove, remove masking tape from the edges of an epoxy repair? I'll actually let you start with that one, Richard, because I think you might, you've been a little closer to some of the hands-on lately, probably. I can know. I can tell you the worst time, and that's months later. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. if you leave epoxy on, it doesn't matter whether it's a, sorry tape on, it doesn't matter whether it's epoxy repair or what it is, and and the tape is out in the sun, and you just can't, you you'd be picking it off with your fingernails and, and leaving glue behind. Um, you know, masking tape in general is to prevent uh, excess runs, uh, you know, getting on the adjacent material. And and my experience is. Um, to get it off as, as soon as you no longer need it. So if your resin is you know, is uh, not running off the surface and you've done your application, um, pulling the tape off around the edge is a good good to do it while the stuff's still wet. If it, the resin's so thick that it's, when you pull the tape off, it's going to run or sag down. You know, it's too early. You've got to wait for the resin to gel. Gelation with polyesters and vinyl esters is normally fairly quick and obvious. It's a wee bit slower process with epoxies, and, and if you are trying to wait for it to gel, you can miss your opportunity. I'd go for it with, when it's wet. The caveat to that is if your masking tape is not just got resin running off the job onto it, but has also got a little bit of fiberglass, you know, uh, drifting past the edge of the, the largest patch and onto the tape. As you pull it off, you may drag that piece of fiberglass. So, you know, you've got to be careful that you're just pulling off tape with resin on it. Tape with fiberglass on it, you probably want to leave it to the point where it has gelled um, and just gelled, and you can run your box cutter knife gently through as you pull the tape off along the edge to cut any fibers that are lapping onto it. But leaving it till it's completely gone hard, yeah, you're going to probably have um, an issue getting the tape off because it's going to, um, it's going to tear around the big thick lumps. Some of it may come off well, depending upon the, the, the strength of your tape. But if you've got any big blobs, you know, your tape's going to rip around those and you'll be back out with a chisel. And uh, yeah, the wet trimming technique they mentioned is a great, great way to go if you got to get rid of glass um, to catch it while it's gelled. I will add that uh, what we call flash tape, and I'm not sure if that's an industry term or um, just a made up term, but uh, tape with a little more plastic can sometimes perform better. Low cost masking tape, uh, the resin can almost soak through or underneath it. Uh, so a, a plastic tape generally works better, what we call flash tape, uh, although they cost more. All right, and I think we're throwing one last quick question, or at least I think it'll be quick. Uh, what is the shelf life of hardener and resin? Not forever. Yeah. I can start there. Uh, it's it, you. You want to talk to the manufacturer, and uh, this is not meant to be any plug for epoxy. But epoxies tend to have a very long shelf life in years. Uh, polyesters tend to be shorter um, because they're what they call pre-promoted to encourage the reaction. So with polyester products, uh, they I often like cooler temperatures to be stored and may have a, a shelf life in months. Uh, epoxy resins actually prefer being stored in warmer temperatures and will have a shelf life uh, longer than that. Um, but in any case, as Richard mentioned, can't emphasize enough proper storage, steel containers, MEKP catalysts, and a proper uh, shelf, but um, it, it sh so should be dated. Things. Do you have anything to add, Richard? If you've, got, if you've got resin that you think is getting a wee bit old in the tooth, you know, uh, one of the, the obvious signs in, with the epoxies, particularly with some of the hardness, is, you know, the the resin that's come out or the hard that's come out and is around the edge of the, the tin may go a bit frothy brown you know but this doesn't mean the stuff inside's gone off what you want to know with that resin if it's too old what's wrong with it you know um 
Now, you can smell cheese that's gone off, but, you know, you sniff the resin, it smells as bad as the day it was made. There's nothing, there's nothing gone wrong with it from a smell test. Um, the characteristics that will change that will concern you will be firstly viscosity. Um, so if it's not the same sort of runniness and, and, and wet out characteristics, something's advanced in the, in the, in the mechanics or the chemistry of it. Uh, and the second, but equally critical, is, is whether or not it cures at the same rate with the same um, uh, amount of catalyst or amount of hardener that you would normally add. You know, at the landing school, um, by just virtue of the fact that we use a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of something else, and some of people give us resin that's a little bit old, um, we often have resin that we look at the container and go, ooh, I wonder if we can use that. And we do a gel test where we'll take the vinyl ester and add the right amount of catalyst and then we'll uh, put in a little jig, but you can just do it by watching it and dipping a stick in it. And our experience is that, you know, with those systems which are being pre-promoted, as the promotion level uh, goes down over time, um, you know, the gel time will stretch out longer and longer to the point where you're going, yeah, it needs to either be re-life with some promotion or, or replaced with new stuff. So um, you can test to see if it's passed its use by date by seeing whether it goes off the same rate. Uh, and if it's if it's not doing what it should be doing, um, you probably better to, if there's a small quantity just to get some fresh stuff. Big drum, you know, you might ask the supplier to, to re-promote it. It's not something you want to do yourself because I said MEKP was a nasty thing. And there's nothing nastier than putting MEKP with the cobalt uh, promoter and seeing what happens. Just don't do that. Two nasties in the shop at the same time is is more than twice as nasty. Mm -hmm. A pot life test is never a bad idea. A simple 100 gram pot life is uh, always a good QC check before you start. All right. Well, uh, we're at our hour here, so uh, really appreciate it. Thanks again, Jeff and Richard, for uh, for helping us out here. And uh, thanks for being kind enough to offer your contact info. So anyone with additional questions, I'm sure they'd gladly help you out. Um, if you're here and you're look, watching this on YouTube, uh, you'll see the link pop up on the screen sometime now. Matt keeps moving it around on me in weird spots. Uh, but it'll be on the screen if you're watching it live. Uh, you'll have a follow-up automated email that'll come out tomorrow with a link to apply for the CEU. So uh, once again, thanks everyone for, for uh, showing up. Any topics you think we should do, shoot us an email, and uh, we will see you all next Thursday. Thanks again, Richard and Jeff. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.